think um, I think most of us are here. So um, let's get started. Uh, the format is going to be that um, I will have kind of an organic conversation, hopefully kind of interviewee with um, Zell and Jameson, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, and because we have so many people here, I'd like to use the chat function as a kind of hand raising. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, or if you'd like to interject or something, you know, just want to jump in, um, please use the chat to get my attention, and then I will call on you. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, a few of my students have prepared introductions. So, um, Lexi, why don't you go first? Hi. Wait, am I on? Yes. OK. Um, so Jameson here is somewhere here. Um, she Hello. has a background um, in education at Northeastern University with a Bachelor of Science um, with like interest in political communication and art history and is currently the Marketing and Development Associate at um, MIT List Visual Arts Center and is also the Founder and Editor-in-Chief at um, the Boston Art Review, which is an independent publication committed to facilitating active discourse and around contemporary art in Boston. Thanks for the intro. Yes. Um, Jameson, will you uh, say hi to the group and if you have anything to add to that? <laughs> sure. Um, and I will quickly do a, a housekeeping thing. Maybe if you're not planning on chatting right now, maybe put yours on mute. I'm hearing a lot of background noise, but it might just be me. So that could be helpful. Um, so yes, hi, thank you for the introduction, Alexis. So my name's Jameson. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief at Boston Art Review. Uh, this publication was started about uh, almost three years ago now, we've produced four print issues and are working on our fifth at, right now. Uh, we're the only contemporary art uh, review publication in uh, Boston. So the publication was really started because there was an evident need for it. Um, I had had several conversations with artists and gallery owners and curators and given the way that the new structure was kind of working and kind of the future and current situations surrounding print media and even online media, um, publications in Boston were folding left and right. Uh, the Phoenix was a really big publication in Boston. They had closed. The Dig Boston was stopping their arts coverage. And Big Red and Shiny was another online publication. And, and all of these publications were kind of closing their doors or limiting their arts coverage. Um, and it became evident that there was really a need. So without really knowing what I was doing or how to run a magazine, I said, okay, let's do this. Um, and kind of put together a small team of, of individuals who were also committed to making this happen. And it's been going well ever since. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's so worth it. So I'm happy to chat about that perspective later on. Um, and then as mentioned, I also work at the List Visual Arts Center at MIT. Now has been a really interesting time to be in my role. Basically, I manage all external communications for the museum, which means anything online or you know, social media, newsletters, et cetera, I oversee. And now that the museum exists only in online or virtually, um, it's been pretty much on me to figure out the best way to communicate with our audiences while the museum doors are closed. So I'm also happy to, to chat about that a little bit. Yeah, I bet that's been really intense. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. <laughs> and intense. Yeah. Um, Cam, would you like to introduce Zalana? So uh, this is Zalana Davis. She is the exhibitions coordinator at the ICA in Boston, but she has also worked in numerous museums and exhibitions for over 10 years. Uh, as a writer and curator, Davis's work through the lens of critical museum theory challenges Western views about sexuality, spirituality, and ethnicity. Uh, Zalana Davis has received a BA from Flagler College in St. Augustine, Florida, and her master's in art history from SCAD in Savannah, Georgia. Thanks, Kim. Zell, how are you doing? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I was just unmuting it. <laughs> I was a, I split my time on Zoom most of the time, so I was trying to hit the space bar. I'm like, oh, that doesn't work here like that. Oh. Um, yes, that's my wheelhouse has evolved over my career. Um, started off 
as a studio artist and exhibiting um, in the Southeast region. Um, when I transitioned into grad school, I realized that I wanted to take lots of different visual stories, and I'm calling visual stories the artwork that artists generate, uh, to stitch those together to create another story, which lent me more towards the curatorial route. And then as a um, independent curator and working in spaces, as you guys either know or will discover, a lot of museums and galleries are actual, actually adapted spaces, meaning most museums and galleries weren't built with the idea of being a museum and gallery. So as an independent curator, I was working in several different spaces that were converted into galleries or museums, which meant that I had to learn how to adapt to the, the, the actual physical space more than just being concerned with the story that I'm telling with different artworks. Transitioned into Boston, where I was the gallery manager for the Boston Center for the Arts, which also meant that I did all the roles, meaning registrar, gallery manager, security, all those things, which um, which was natural for me with my organizational skills to kind of be more in the logistics wheelhouse. And that's where I'm situated at the ICA, where I'm the basically the logistics coordinator and project manager for the entire museum's exhibition department. So in that in that work, now that you're at the ICA, are you working directly with artists and also with people all over the museum? And how do you um, how do you coordinate that? How do how is it to connect people in that way? Yeah, so it's it's I think of it a lot like being a train conductor. So mm -hmm. I know that there are these stops that I have to make, and each stop has a different gathering of people. So one stop or the initial stop is coordinating with the artist studio or the artists themselves depending on you know how much cachet they have you know <laughs> working with their with their team to to plot out the major projects within their exhibition that are going to need to be triaged in some kind of way the next stop is communicating all of those you know hanging a painting on the wall in terms of you know gallery mechanics is like pretty nut and bolts like that's nothing we don't e we barely even talk about those things but if you're talking about sculpture media art fibers like anything that's three-dimensional or wired we spend a lot of time in the museum talking about accessibility talking about education talking about programmatic talking about performance art um and how we can link all those things in together and then the last station is taking those programmatic cross-departmental conversations and the artist's vision and then making that into an exhibition. So several different avenues of conversations and trying to stitch them together while we move forward in this goal of getting this exhibition up and running. I don't know if I answered your question. I hope I did. Yeah, totally. So are the, are the artists involved in developing any of that programming as well as the exhibition or are they just involved in the exhibitions themselves? We invite our artists to be as involved as they want to within the parameters, of course, of time and money. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you can have an artist that wants to, you know, uh, fly every single person from across the nation to a DJ performance or something like that. And we're like, well, slow your roll, we can't do that. But of course we want to achieve the artist's goal. We want to achieve the artist's vision with the parameters that we have. Some artists are super hands-off and some artists are, are um, kind of defer to their technicians and some artists are all about it all the time. Mm. Cool. Um, Jameson, how yes. um, how does your role involve artists directly? Like, do you do you work directly with the artists at both the list and at Bar, or are you doing um, like how how does how does your relationship with artists work? Yeah, good question. So I'll start first with Boston Art Review. Um, with Bar, I always try to be super artist first. So. We are, I think, a little bit unconventional with other publications. Um, say you were invited to, uh, say a writer wanted to do an interview with you as an artist. Um, the p person who's writing the article, the author, would reach out to the publication, pitch their idea. The 
publication could then say, yep, that sounds good. We're super excited about having an interview with this artist. Um, here's some parameters and guidelines we want to think about. Okay, go forth and, and do it. Um, so we kind of follow that model, but I add in another step, which is that I always want to make sure that the artist is pleased with the final result of what goes into print. And this is because the role of Boston Art Review is, is we publish everyone, I mean, sometimes we're giving artists their first review in print or their first interview in print. And having a piece of press can be a really valuable tool for an artist moving forward. And so we always want to make sure that the work that we're putting out reflects what that artist also needs during this time in their career. Um, it adds a lot more work for us, but I think it makes it more worth it. So that includes, you know, double checking that things that they were quoted on are, are accurate, um, making sure that the images that we've selected, the portrait that is going to be, you know, the full page spread is something that they feel happy about. Um, the worst is when you put something in print and they're like, oh, I didn't mean to say it like that, or oh my God, I hate that photo. And of course, it's kind of little things, but we want the artist to feel pleased and proud and able to show their work, how it's represented in print. So all is to say with the magazine, I work super closely with the artists, sometimes maybe too closely. Um, <laughs> at the List Center, you know, we're bringing in internationally exhibiting artists um, to show either in our main gallery space or in our project space. Um, so as the external communications person, um, my job is handling, you know, anything that goes on social media in our newsletters on the website. So my conversations with artists is usually centered around like, hey, is there anything I should know about uh, before we post images of your work on social media? Or is, is there something in particular um, you know, that you want to make sure that we don't post or that we speak about it in a certain way, or do you want to be tagged on Instagram? I mean, it's little things, um, but I'm kind of a part of the conversation every step along the way because now social media and online platforms are really the voice of um, of museums. And so my role is super integral in understanding how we're going to portray a certain exhibition online. Um, and similarly to, to what Zolana was saying, you know, sometimes the artist is like, I don't care. I mean, do whatever you normally do. It's your job. And other times they do want to be super involved and kind of understand what the process of putting things online is. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag, but I always try to make myself super available to the artists, no matter what the circumstances are. Cool. What are the kinds of things that um, artists should know to advocate for? And what kind of questions are appropriate to ask when an artist is working on developing something like that with with a publisher or or with someone who works online or yeah it's it's a good question i mean in like i said boston art review is kind of different you know i i've written for other magazines and, and have friends that are editors at other publications and a lot of times artists are told no like um one example was we were working with christine soon kim whose work is on view well it's not on view it's on view at the list center right now but the doors are closed um, and there was, um, she had a couple of pieces published where the headlines were kind of super insensitive, uh, to her. She is a deaf artist and felt really uncomfortable with how some press was, was kind of misappropriating her work. And so she set up a guideline and said, if you are running a story about me, you have to run your headline by me beforehand. And some magazines were like, okay, that's fair. And others were like, absolutely. We don't do that for anyone. So. I think it's always worth asking if you have something that is important to you and how your work is portrayed online and how your voice is represented. It doesn't hurt to ask. Um, I would say more often than not, people are open to the conversation and, and other times, you know, whatever. And that's where we also have our own voices and as do you with your own platforms that you can come forth after a piece comes out and say, hey, here's here's what this really means or here's who I am and, and here's what I'm thinking about. So, you know, even when the press gets it wrong, which does happen, um, you know, you still do have have a voice of your own and don't be afraid to use it. Thank you. That's such a useful thing for our students here. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, often the kind of the ethics and the, the way that kind of the, the manners of these particular environments can be really opaque to those who like don't already have access to them. Yeah. Um, and I think for, for publications that can be particularly mysterious. And then I think sometimes people get some weird advice about the in-person stuff. 
And um, Zolana, I was hoping that you would kind of jump in with that. Like, are there particular things that you look for that are like kind of these little signs or like codes about whether someone, whether you're like when you first start working with someone, how do you know whether they're going to be a, like good to work with or not good to work with? What are you looking for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, getting flashbacks. Okay. <laughs> well, um, you know, I'll I'll give two different situations. So, like at the BCA, um, where I was, uh, we had invited curator model, and then they would bring in the artist. Was just a, a different setup where I was. Everyone was pretty much meeting everyone at the same time. Yeah. At, at the ICA, it's a, the vetting process before an exhibition is something that is certainly going to happen. Uh, it's a while. Like they're, the, the curators are meeting with artists years and years before even selecting a show with them. So it's kind of through that contact, we finally have an exhibition that is approved. It's going to go forward. The curator that I'm working with will just be like, yeah, so just a heads up, um, they're a little, you know, or <laughs> or if it's a traveling exhibition, which is something I also manage, um, the other institution will say like, yeah, when we are working with these artists from this traveling exhibition, be, be wary of this X, Y, and Z behavior. So I, I say that for two reasons. As an artist, you definitely want to advocate for yourself. You definitely want to stand up for uh, your artwork and more importantly, the concept behind your artwork. Um, but with that said, the way you stand up for it and your behavior and how you treat people, whether they are the, the security guard at the front or if they are the executive of your museum matters. It, and not only does it matter within that museum, but museum professionals go to conferences where we talk about shows that we're wanting to either have tour or come in or artists that we're going to work on and those characteristics do get around so I, I like with all things just be just be mindful of that um yeah so be polite yeah that's a good that's a good <laughs> point i mean we've, we've had it with um writers and artists that we've worked for worked with for the magazine and it's kind of the same thing we're like okay, we are not going to do something with them again. And, and usually what it comes down to is a sense of entitlement. And whenever an artist is kind of making demands, um, especially, you know, the list center is a smaller institution. We have a staff of a permanent staff of 13. Our install team is about four people. You know, we can't do some of the things that artists ask for. And being like humble and graceful with how you ask for things will get you a long, long, long way. Mm -hmm. Do either of you have examples of um, people who you thought were just really good at that? And how, how did they, how did they approach you? All right. I, I have an example. Um, should uh, I prefer not to use names though? Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we don't need to do name dropping, <laughs> I'll, but I'll use a fake name just so I have like a pronoun to work with. Yeah. So, like, let's say Mike. Um, so I was working with this one artist, Mike, phenomenal <laughs> installation work, and with all um media works, they are a nightmare. Technology is supposed to make our lives easier. It does in a lot of ways, but installation art is a nightmare, but amazing at the same time. And as a video artist, Mike wanted very specific parameters met. And one of the parameters that he wanted us to meet is was a, 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 a obnoxiously loud volume to their work. Mm -hmm. I mean, so loud that the artwork in adjoining rooms would be shaking off the walls. And of course, with other loaned artwork, that's just something we can't have happen. That's not healthy for the artwork. So you go back to Mike and you say like, calmly, hey, hey guy, we really wanna make your vision be a thing, but hey, look at this other stuff that you're putting in danger by having this one spec that needs to be made. Can we 
compromise on this. And most of the time, artists are gracious and they'll communicate that to their text and they'll work with our preparators to meet that. Um, the times that you don't want are the artists that will just keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing and they're unrelenting to the point where it puts the crew, it makes them stressed out, makes the curators stressed out, and it makes the process incredibly unpleasant for everyone who is literally on the page just trying to make this thing happen. So most artists that are hearing information that they don't necessarily want to hear, they will, they'll take it if you can show examples of how what they want to achieve is untenable. But if you communicate it in a way that that is affronting to their vision or the content, uh, they're less likely to, to receive that. So it's got to be practical effects of their artwork rather than, you know, I don't like you're using this color. Like, that doesn't matter. Like, that doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. And, and similarly, at the List Center, again, I won't use particular names, but um, we had a situation with an artist. It was their first institutional show. Um, which means that they weren't, you know, super used to working within a kind of, prof you know, institutional museum context. Um, this was something that for whatever reason, the curator did not really foresee. Um, the curator was under the impression that because this artist had shown in kind of other contexts that they, um, you know, would be a good fit for our institutional context. Um, and a lot of issues came up uh, from the artist requesting each time we had installation views of the exhibition taken, the artist didn't like them and demanded that photos be taken like over and over and over again and kept trying to send like their friends who are photographers to come and take photos. And we tried to accommodate it to be, you know, to help them out. And we were like, OK, it's it's, you know, her first show we will will try to make this work, but it just puts so much added pressure on our crew, on our curators, um, that it was just a pain in the butt. And all is to say, you know, when all of you have your fir first institutional shows, you know, be ready, meet deadlines. If the work needs to be shipped at a certain point, just have it ready to go because it's just gonna cause trickle effects, you know, down the line. If the museum has said like, our photographers coming on this day, you know, be cool with it. Like there's there's a way to kind of make reasonable requests, but also to be professional about it. And, you know, it's a bummer for this artist who we worked with. You know, now everyone in our museum kind of knows like this artist was a pain to work with. And like word has kind of gotten out, unfortunately, just kind of like what Zalana was saying at, at conferences and whatnot. So yeah, you never want to be on the other end of, of that. <laughs> Lexi, what's your question? Oh, you're on mute still. Hi, sorry. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, um, how do artists like come to you guys like with proposals and like how does that end up changing like over time? Like I know you said like these happen like years over years at a time. And I'm just like wondering like, like, is it like an email? And then you guys like, like, when do you like, um, like kind of realize like, we're gonna put this in the books and this is gonna happen. Like, when do you like make that decision? How does that happen? Uh, so got some not great news <laughs> about that, but you know, I'm, I'm just gonna be very frank and very honest. Um, I'll say back in the day when I was a studio art student and even when I was exhibiting in that little bubble between undergrad and grad school, the uh, guidance that I usually used to get uh, would be like email curators, email museums, email, you know, solicit, like send them your portfolio. And I would say maybe for a gallery or maybe for a um, um, an art center that would work. I'll say in transitioning more to the ICA realm, the, the curators do not like that. 
Um, they do not like getting emails with artist work or anything like that. And I'll tell you why. There, there's such competition in the world for artists to have, whether it's their a group showing or a solo show, either, either case. And I'm gonna put that on the side. Now let's add to that um, the discussion that we were having before where you have a lot of different personalities that get into the arts. You have those that um, you have those that are down to earth artists and you have those that are uh, less so down to earth artists. And you have a field of people and expenses and events and and especially the higher and higher higher you go in the museum system, the more that is on the line for every single exhibition that happens. So to roll the dice on some person that you haven't had at least a second or third contact with, whether you know a gallerist or a curator that's worked with that artist or anything like that, to vet them as a person is going to be very difficult, which is one of the main reasons why email solicitations don't work anymore, because there are a lot of people that, that you know, it's just, it's almost like screening a phone call. Like, are you going to answer the phone number that you don't know? Or are you going to answer the phone number of someone that you said, hey, so-and-so is going to call you about this opportunity? It's literally kind of the same thing. The third thing I'll say is your best bet is to start with galleries, is to start with whether they are university galleries, private galleries. Um, if your friend has a space somewhere that they call a gallery, even do that, build your resume and build your, how many eyes get in front of your work and worry less about the uh, notoriety behind that gallery because what you need to have is that um, the, almost like that group validation or that social validation of you as a person slash artist and not just as artist. Like that's going to be the extra bump um, in terms of being noticed in that way. Um, yeah. Um, question for, for both of you. What, um, so are these students, you know, they, they are at the beginning of their careers <laughs> and, um, and I know that both of you have worked, are currently in these institutions that are kind of at, at the top of the field and at the front of the game. And both of you have also worked with these smaller institutions and with emerging artists. And Jameson, you're, you're working with emerging artists sometimes mm -hmm. across an art review. So what are some of the ways that artists like our students can get your attention? Is it like nuts and bolts stuff? Is it like showing up for events and saying hi? Is it, um, uh, mm -hmm the professionalism of their presentation of the work in their small little shows? Is it, um, uh, is it speaking clearly in emails? What are like some specific things that can get your attention? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I get a lot of emails through my inbox of, from people that I don't know. Um, and emails, like Lizalano was saying with like the screening a phone call, you know, they're, they're hard. Um, if I get a random email that's, often unprofessional. I get a lot of emails that are like, hi, here's a link to my portfolio, check it out. And I'm like, okay, like 95% <laughs> of the time, I don't even look at it because it's just a not probably not worth my time. And I, it's, it's probably not what I'm, I mean, I, I have to kind of think of my time in a way that's like, okay, can I spend 10 minutes looking at a portfolio of someone that I don't know that, you know, maybe isn't even Boston based or what have you. Or, you know, do I keep working on this article that I'm editing? And most of the time it's, I need to do the work that's right in front of me. Um, so, I, you know, if you are reaching out to people, I would say pay, pay attention to open calls. When you see open calls, you know, that's when people's inboxes are open and they do want to be seeing your portfolios and they do want to see the work that you're making. So when those are happening, um, you know, that's when you want to be ready to go. Have your portfolio put together in a super professional way. Send an email that is, you know, introduces yourself and tells the either curator or editor why you're emailing them. Hi, I saw your call on blank, blank, blank. This is the work that I'm doing. Here's a link to this body of work that I think might be relevant for X reason. Let me know if you have other questions. You know, it doesn't have to be long, but giving a little bit of context is even 
so much better than just like a cold out of the blue email. Um, the way that I meet artists, whether it's for exhibitions at galleries that I, I've curated or shows that I've guest juried, you know, I am more inclined to, if it's not a blind jury, to um, pick artwork for artists whose name I kind of know and recognize. So that could be either someone who I've met at an event or that I've seen at another exhibition. You know, showing up and being present in your community by going to talks, going to lectures, um, you know, engaging with people when you're out places goes a long way. Um, and you know, then there's sometimes where I see artwork from an artist who I don't know, I don't know anything about, and the work does, you know, blow me away. Um, and oftentimes it's because it's presented well. Um, you know, it's it's either photographed well in like a great studio space, or even if I'm seeing it in person, you know, it's framed well, it's presented in a professional way. Like, like the, all these little things kind of add up. Um, and there's a way to do all of these without putting a ton of time and more importantly, a time of a ton of money into them. Um, so I'm happy to kind of follow up on that more later. But yeah, I think just kind of being professional about things, which I'm sure is advice you guys get all the time, but it does really make a difference. I wanted to jump on that too, um, about going to exhibitions and conferences, anything like that. Um, go to exhibitions, especially the openings of artwork that is either in the material aspect, like, shows of exhibitions that resonate with your artwork because curators that are going to be drawn to your work in the same or rather if you have a certain type of work and you're going to exhibitions that are resonating in that same frequency you'll draw the same type of curators that would resonate with your work meaning if you worked on sculptures about birds and there's another exhibition about sculptures on birds you should probably be at that uh, that opening and look at the profiles even on LinkedIn of the curators in this area who are who have exhibited curated shows about that same type of genre get to know their face and then when you're at those openings say hello to them even if it's just a hello I saw your your the show that you cu curated at blah 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 and nothing else and then the next time you see them say a little bit more like be around those curators that are around the artwork that resonates with you. <laughs> that is such useful advice. Thank you. 